Welcome to our broadcast from the Church of the Resurrection in Crosby, Texas. Today's message is brought to you by Father Rusty Elliser, Senior Pastor of the Church. Before we begin, invite your family and friends to gather around the screen as we watch and hear the sermon from God's servant. And now as we join the congregation in the nave of the church, we pray you will open your mind, your ears, and your heart to receive the word of God. Well, I know our lectors always hope that it will fall to them on the day of Pentecost. So they can talk about Pamphylia, Phrygia, Cappadocia, Elamites. Good job. You're clear for next year. Um, so we've known each other well enough that, you know, you're honest with me, and I hope that I can be honest with you. So I'll, I'll go ahead and say, I'm going to preach to you two sermons. Okay, let's just get that out of the way. Not that it's going to be uh, real long, but um, there are, are definitely two parts of it. So the first one, the first part, I'd like for us to look at St. Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. And then after that, we'll celebrate the Spirit a little bit and consider some things that the Holy Spirit does. We won't be able to cover all of them, but a couple of things as a way of reminder and to spur us on as we worship God today. So the first part, one of the things that, um, that I'm thankful for, I know many of us are thankful for, and I, quite frankly, am still amazed by, is our ability to forecast the weather in, in, in the time in which we live. You know, one day last week, there's a forecast that I read pretty regularly, and, and the guys predicted um, the heaviest rain on this day will be east of Houston and north of I-10. And when I got on there that day and looked at the radar, sure enough, there was the big green blob, exactly where they said it would be. Um, and speaking of the radar, you know, weather radars are helpful. We can, can turn on our televisions or pick up our phones, and usually we can see the weather coming. A lot of us, uh, was it Tuesday night, we were watching that bright, uh, bright red line of storms that were moving in, in from the west. And so a skilled meteorologist or forecaster is, is helpful, very helpful. Well, ancient Israel had her forecasters, and they were called prophets. They weren't usually predicting the weather, although sometimes they did predict the weather. It's going to rain or it's not going to rain, maybe for years. A lot of their messages were not predictions at all. They were just talking about what was going on with the people at the time. But sometimes the Lord did show them what was going to happen in the future. And that was the case for the prophet Joel. In Joel's own day, the Lord had warned about an impending day of the Lord. And that's a phrase that comes up um, pretty often in the prophets. And Joel went on to tell of the day when his voice, though, would not be the only voice speaking. He said, one day, the Lord will pour out His Spirit on all flesh, and then sons and daughters old men and young men, even male and female servants, would dream dreams, see visions, and they too would prophesy about what was going to take place. The Lord said, on that day there would be signs in the sky and on the earth, there would be bloodshed, there would be fire and smoke, the sun would turn to darkness, the moon to the color of blood, all building up to this great and awesome day of the Lord. A storm would sweep into Judah, just like the time when a foreign army had swept into the land like a plague of locusts. And if you know much about Joel, locusts uh, figure in there a great deal. But as terrible as that day was going to be, the day before Joel talked about, the day before this great destruction would come, it did not have to be the destruction of all the people. It was not too late. People could still repent. And the Lord said, everyone who called on the name of the Lord would be saved. He promised that in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there would be those who would escape. After the storm had passed, there would be survivors whom the Lord had called. Now, of course, all this is important for us today because this is the passage that Peter quoted in his famous sermon on the day of Pentecost that we just heard read while ago. Think about what had happened. Jesus had been exalted. He had received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He, would, he had poured out the Spirit on His disciples, not just the twelve apparently, but all of them who were gathered there praying. And what were they doing? They were prophesying. They were telling about the mighty works of God, probably what God had done, and what He was about to do. Because once again, in that day, the day of the Lord was coming. Just as in Joel's day, 
This was going to be a dreadful day of war, with battle and bloodshed. The sky would be filled with smoke, the sun would be darkened, the moon would, be, would, would turn to the color of blood. Now, I've said this before, probably recently, we're all learning things as we grow as Christians. The more I read and think and pray, the more I find myself convinced that Peter, on this day, and the others who were talking, were not talking about what we might call the end of the world. I don't even think they were talking about what we would call the final judgment. Although how those people responded to Peter's message would certainly determine what happened to them at the final judgment. But like the prophet Joel, Peter was telling these Jews that the radar showed a dreadful storm rolling toward Jerusalem. There was a catastrophe coming to the city. But Peter said to them, but you don't have to die in this catastrophe. If they would call on the name of the Lord, if they would accept the fact that Jesus was God's Messiah, if they would repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submit to His rule, follow His way, which of course would mean not taking up their swords and going to war with the Romans. In fact, Jesus had said, when you see these things coming, you need to turn and run away from the city, right? They, if they would do these things, they would be forgiven. They would be spared. And as members of this new community, they too would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I think we can pretty much prove this is what Peter had in mind, because what does Luke tell us that Peter kept saying to the people after he gives us Peter's sermon? He doesn't say anything about the world is about to come to an end, although their world, in a sense, was about to come to an end. Listen to what he says. After he records Peter's, sermons, uh, Peter's sermon, Luke says this, Acts chapter 2, verse 4. Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners and saying to them, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Jesus had spoken about the judgment that was going to come on that generation if they rejected him. And Peter was simply preaching the same thing that he had heard his master preaching those days before. That generation had rejected God's Messiah. They were still holding on to their nationalistic hopes, still ready to go to war with Rome, or at least they would be in a few decades. And Peter was warning them and pleading with them, saying, listen, that ship is going down. Abandon that sinking ship. Get on this lifeboat, this community that we call the church that confesses Christ, and it will carry you safely through the storm. And on that day, as Peter warned them and urged them, Luke tells us, 3,000 Jews were convinced by his message. They believed Peter's preaching, and they were baptized. Now, I know we would probably like to stop and discuss that for a long time. We can maybe on another day. But I think whatever else we might say about the day of Pentecost, if we're thinking about Peter's sermon, this is where we have to start, in this firm, historical context. And just once again to review, just think through how it works. The wrath of God was coming to Israel. They would go to war with Rome. The Lord would withdraw His hand and give His people over to their enemies. And they would suffer unspeakably. If you've never read it, go online and look at the writings of Josephus as he explains what the suffering was like in the city and outside the city. But what was going to happen to Israel had already happened to Jesus. Jesus had been given over into the hands of the Romans. He was the faithful Jew who had been crucified. His blood had been poured out. The sun had grown dark while he died. The day of the Lord had come in advance, as it were, on him. But then, by the Holy Spirit, God had raised Jesus from the dead. On a very historic level, Jesus, on a very historic level, had saved his people from the fate that was coming on the nation. And those who believed in Him would not suffer that fate. Rather, they would be the beginning of a renewed community. In the Messiah, they would receive the blessing of God. And then, not just them, but all people who would believe God's promise in Christ, turn to Him and be baptized. All people would receive the blessing of the Holy Spirit and the forgiveness of sins. And here we are today. Now, Jesus had told the disciples, 
that it would be better for them if he went away so that the Spirit could come. And today we celebrate the fact that he has indeed come. So this is sermon number two. You get two for the price of one. It's not a bad thing. So just, just four things briefly that the Holy Spirit does. We can't get into all of them, but here's here four. Number one, the Holy Spirit gives life. Our psalm today that we read said about God's creatures, when God takes away their breath, they die and return to their dust. But when God sends forth His Spirit, they are created, and God renews the face of the ground. We confess each week, we'll do it in just a moment, that we believe in the Holy Spirit, what? The Lord, the giver of life. The giver of life. It is by His Spirit that God gives life and renews His creation. It was by the Holy Spirit that God had raised Jesus from the dead. And on this day, the life that filled Christ Jesus the head came rushing down into the members of His body and brought us to life. The Spirit has raised us up. It is by the Holy Spirit that we live. Another picture, another way, when God had first made Adam, there's Adam's newly formed body lying there on the ground. What happened? God leaned down and breathed into Adam the breath of life. After his resurrection, what did Jesus do? He was with the apostles. What did he do? He breathed on them. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. It is through Christ that the breath of God breathes in us. It is through the risen Christ that the life of God lives in us. Well, each of these four things could be a sermon on its own, but we'll go on quickly. A second thing that the Holy Spirit does is that He unifies. In our Old Testament lesson today, we saw people who had come together in pride and arrogance. I always kind of laugh a little bit when we read that because I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce S-H-I-N-A-R. You know, they went to that plane called Shinar, and I, and I think, you know, Texans here, they got to a place called Shiner, and they're thinking, it's not too bad, you know. But they didn't build a brewery. They, um, they were trying to build for themselves a city, right? They were trying to build a tower, rather, with a city, a tower that could reach up into heaven. They would build their way up into heaven. These were proud, arrogant people who wanted to make a name for themselves. Turn to the next chapter when God calls Abraham, and God said, I will make your name great. These people wanted to make their own name great. But the Lord brought all that to a quick stop, kind of a funny story, by coming down and confusing their languages. Most of us know how frustrating it can be not to be able to communicate because of language barriers. God confused their languages, and they spread out. So, that's the Tower of Babel. What do we see today at Pentecost? We see Jews, still Jews, from many nations, though, are gathered in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit filled the apostles, and they miraculously began to speak in other languages that they had not known before. Imagine if something like that were to happen today. You know, imagine if the multitude of people that are here on vacation in Crosby, because we're kind of a tourist destination. So, you know, there are people out there visiting from places like Germany and France and Russia and all, all over. Imagine if all of a sudden, those people came together and we could just start speaking languages that we didn't know. So, so Brett is rattling off uh, perfect French and Mimi is speaking Russian and um, uh, Matt is speaking German. Imagine if Viv could speak Spanish. And, um, and, and so she does speak Spanish. That's part of the joke. You guys have got to get to know each other a little better. I know during COVID we haven't. Um, all of a sudden, people are here speaking these languages, and these people from other countries are going, oh my goodness, I thought these people were all from Crosby. I understand what they're saying. That's what happened on Pentecost, and when that happened, what, what happens? People are brought together. On Monday Thursday, Jesus prayed that those who believed in Him would be one. And we see the beginning of that in the coming of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians, St. Paul wrote these words. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, 
eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It is the Spirit who produces unity. We sang that last week. We're one in the Spirit. We're one in the Lord. We are already one in the Lord, and the Spirit that works in us works that unity out among us. It doesn't mean that we're all the same. We're not all the same at all. But we are one, and so if we will be humble and gentle and patient, if we will bear with one another, then we can stick together. Sometimes that does mean you have to go to another person and address them. But even then you go in humility and love, and you go with hope that the unity will be even stronger after that conversation. Well, third, the Holy Spirit bears witness that we are children of God. In Romans 8, you read these words. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Jennifer and I have had several discussions with people about adoption, about adopting children. And some of our good friends have adopted kids. And we've talked to them about the challenges of doing that. And a lot of times people think, you know, we're going to bring this child into our home. We'll give him a safe place to live. We will shower her with love. Her life will be changed. His heart will be renewed. And sometimes it happens just like that. But others have told us that those old wounds in some of these children are so deep, they'll say it seems that no matter what we do, no matter what we say, he is just not able to rest secure in our love, much less to return that love and respect to us. And I wonder if these parents might say, if only I could take my spirit and put it into the heart of this child so that he can know my love, know his security, and then love me in return. There have never been more wounded, damaged, fearful, even bitter and hateful children than God's children. But through Christ, our Father sends His own Spirit into our hearts to say, you are mine, and I delight in you. And the waves of that love keep washing onto the shores of our hard, frightened, angry hearts, wearing those things away, so that sometimes very suddenly, sometimes over many years, we finally become convinced of the love of our Father. And we begin to believe that the God who spoke the world into existence the God who upholds all things by His power, He is our Father. And He is for us. And we're going to be all right. By the Spirit, we hear Him say, My child. And the same Spirit leads us to join Jesus and say, My Father. And then as we know that we are the beloved children of God, the same Holy Spirit begins forth to bear His fruit in our lives. Sometimes you hear people talk about spirit-filled churches, spirit-filled Christians. Sometimes by that they mean churches are Christians who are loud, right? If you're loud, you must be spirit-filled. Or Christians that seem to live on a different plane. Or Christians that just don't like liturgy. Right? We're spirit-filled, we don't have a prayer book. Well, there's certainly, you don't have to have a prayer book, there's certainly nothing wrong with lifting our hands, lifting our voices at times. But a church or a Christian who is filled with the Spirit will not primarily be recognized by volume. What does she look like? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's what a Spirit-filled Christian looks like. Somebody once asked an old country preacher about members of this congregation. They said, you know, I noticed in the congregation, some people jump and clap and shout hallelujah, and uh, some people don't hardly make any noise at all. They just kind of sit there quietly in quiet prayer. And they asked the old preacher, which one do you prefer? And he responded, I don't really care how loud they shout or how high they jump, as long as they hit the ground walking straight. 
He recognized the life of the Spirit, a life of humility, obedience. Hey, jump, shout, do what you want. Hit the ground walking straight. But we can talk about the Spirit convicting of sin. We can talk about the Spirit bearing witness to Christ and enabling us to do the same. But we'll stop there for today. So let us rejoice in the Spirit's presence in the church, in our hearts, by Him, through Him, and with and in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us give thanks to the Father from whom He proceeds. Amen. If you are watching from home today and unable to receive the body of Christ in person, please join with us in the following prayer. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to possess you within my soul. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you, together with all your faithful people gathered around every altar of your church, and I embrace you with all the affections of my soul. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Thank you for watching the broadcast today. We hope you will visit the campus of the Church of the Resurrection and take advantage of the many ministries available to you and your family. Until next week, may God richly bless you and keep you.